Pints with Jack, bonus episode. Interviews on the Council of Trent and classical theism. Hello and welcome to Pints with Jack. It's David here. And over the past couple of weeks, I've been a guest on a couple of podcasts. So I wanted to let you know about them. I was invited onto Trent Horn's podcast, The Council of Trent, and the title there is a pun, so it's Council S-E-L. We actually recorded two episodes, and I spent most of the first episode talking about the life of C.S. Lewis. Here's a little clip. And he wasn't always a Christian, no. so tell us about his early life. So Lewis's mother died of cancer when he was about the age of 10. And he has this spiritual autobiography called Surprise by Joy, and he writes very movingly about it. He says, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable, they disappeared from my life. And shortly afterwards, Jack was sent to England to boarding school, and he really hated England from the very first moment. <clears throat> what did he hate about it? He didn't like the way people spoke. He didn't like the unfamiliar... So they, whether they had stone walls versus fences, everything was just different. It mm -hmm. was just alien to him, and it just seems very strange. But he went, to, went through his schooling, and he progressively became an atheist. Mm -hmm. And it was for a couple of reasons. One was that he really loved mythology, particularly the, the Norse myths. But in his education, he was told that all paganism is false, all of Christianity is true. And not only did that not ring true to him, well, if the pagan mythology is just made up, well, then so is Christianity. They're just myths. Lies breathe through, lies breathe through silver, as he described right. it. Right. So he would be like a lot of modern atheists today who say, well, I just believe in one less God than you do. You know, you don't believe in Thor. You don't believe in Zeus. Well, I just believe in one less one. So he basically in the early 20th century, he was adopting this modern atheist argument even in the early 20th century. Mm. And the other argument he adopted is also a very common one. It's the problem of pain and suffering. Right. He would often quote the uh, Epicurean poet Lucretius who wrote, had God designed the world, it would not be a world so frail and faulty as we see. Mm -hmm. He couldn't reconcile the idea of a good God with the world that he saw around him and also the own suffering that he himself had experienced. After the death of his mother. Mm -hmm. So he's going through boarding school. He's an atheist. After school, though, he goes and he fights in World War I. Yes. It surprised a lot of people to know that he's a veteran. He actually arrived at the front lines on his 19th birthday. Oh, so wow. That's quite a present. And so you get this atheist who already has a pretty hardened view about the world. You go into World War One. I, I mean, that's pro honestly, even compared to World War II, that was probably the most devastating war in the history of the 20th century, just in its brutality with the mm -hmm. trench warfare, chemical warfare. I'm sure that probably had an effect on him. Absolutely. But he said he never, he never sunk so low as to pray. <laughs> so even still, the, you know, people sometimes say there's no atheists in foxholes, but there are people who are, are still atheists, and even the horror of war kind of uh, solidifies their cynicism towards the world, and they just see all this evil, and they can't see God, though that, that changes, because afterwards, he goes back to Oxford, mm -hmm. and he really doubles down on the schooling. Oh, yes. He gets three firsts. He gets it in Greek and Latin literature, philosophy and ancient history, and lastly, in English. Although, it doesn't warm my heart to know he was just terrible at mathematics. You, know, you have this very great man, but with this very great failing, he just couldn't add numbers together. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that. That helps me, because I am not very good at math. And I think honestly, it deals with the teachers you have. Like in high school, I had an amazing history teacher and that set me on my love of history. And so that's, that's allowed things to go very well for me to really enjoy uh, studying ancient history, connecting the faith in that way. I didn't have as strong teachers in mathematics though. Mm -hmm. And so when I was doing my math work, it, it just didn't click for me. So it, it's so funny. You now I can do history, I can do English, but math just still still boggles the mind. We can't be perfect at everything. And it was the same with Lewis. And what's quite delightful is you'll find regularly in his books, he'll use mathematics as an example. In particular, that if you are doing a sum and you make a mistake, there's no good in just carrying on. You're just going to propagate the error. You have to go back to where you made the mistake and fix it there. And he knew that from experience trying to do all his math homework. <laughs> exactly. All right, so he's going. He's a very learned individual. So that was my first episode with Trent. And we then spent the second episode talking about the wisdom that can be found in Lewis's writings. Here's another little extract to give you an idea of the sort of thing that we spoke about. 
But let's talk about that basic belief in God, because I want to talk about some other arguments Lewis puts forward people may not be as familiar with. I had a friend request from the other day uh, a resource for a relative of hers on the subject of knowing that heaven is real, but not one that's religious, one that's more philosophical. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's kind of hard to prove heaven just from philosophy. Then I thought, I'll give you one argument, the argument from desire. Yeah. by C.S. Lewis. And that might be helpful if you want more than just a biblical defense of heaven, but a philosophical one. Tell us about Lewis's argument from desire. Honestly, this is my favorite argument for the existence of God. It's not the most rigorous of philosophical defenses that you will ever find. And it certainly isn't in mere Christianity where Lewis doesn't present it as a syllogism and qualify all of his terms. Right. But he, he communicates something that I always feel just resonates very deeply within me. And he starts off by saying... The world around us disappoints us. It's just inevitably going to let us down. And he asks us, well, how are we going to respond to this? And he says that there are three main ways. The first is the hedonist way. Uh, if your car disappoints you, if your job disappoints you, if your wife disappoints you, just get new versions of all of them. If, if you don't have enough money, go get more. Just get what makes you feel good. Exactly. Find whatever will make you feel good. And the belief that there is something out there that is going to plug that gap in your heart. The other way, he says, is you can just be a stoic and just accept the fact that life is going to let you down. But he says that the Christian draws a different lesson from this experience. He says that creatures aren't born with a desire unless a satisfaction for that desire exists. Mm -hmm. He says a baby feels hunger. Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. And here's the line that just resonates in my soul. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Mm. So we have this desire for God or perfect happiness. It cannot be satisfied in this life. Our desires are not in vain. They do have a corresponding object. Therefore, this desire must be satisfied in the next life, heaven or eternal life with God. Yeah. And Peter Kraft, he, tie, he tidies up uh, Lewis's argument and offers some slightly more rigorous philosophical categories to show that this desire is real and it has an object. You know, what's funny is I'm sympathetic to this argument. I agree. Like if I was in a debate, I wouldn't put this argument out there because to me, it's more of a non-rational argument, not an irrational one. But I also call it intuitive or you either see it or you don't. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Why We're Catholic, I offer a similar intuitive argument about Jesus, that the very name of Jesus causes a discomfort in people that other names do not. And I believe that's evidence behind the unique power and identity of the person of Jesus. Now, that is, you know, I've, that's been criticized by other people who I think take my argument too literally. It's not like I'm saying this is the best evidence for Jesus, mm -hmm. but just that for some people, we'll see that and say, oh, yeah, and other people won't. If you don't see it, that's fine. And I think it's the same with the argument for desire. My other favorite one is, there is the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, therefore there is a God. Yes, that's Kreef's, I think, in his 20 Arguments for God, I think that's number 18. He says you either get this one or you don't. Right, and, and I think that's the case, <laughs> and it's okay to present that. Now, I've thought about the argument for desire, and I've always put on my philosopher's hat, and I always tried to debunk my own arguments I use. What's hard for me is, I, I can think of a few desires that I don't believe have a natural corresponding object, but perhaps they don't. The, my silver bullet I used to go to before talking to you right this very moment <laughs> was most people have a natural corresponding desire to change the past, to not have made certain mistakes. It's universal, but it's impossible. It can't be done, even for God. But perhaps that just means not that we have a desire to change the past, but we have a desire to live a perfect, moral, and upright life. Mm -hmm. And that's really more the desire that we have, and that is one that will be satisfied in the next life. And so, because there's other desires, you know, I have a desire to fly. No, not really. There, there are <laughs> desires that are passing, uh, but most, you're right, most desires we have. Now, of course, someone could be hungry and there's no food, but there is such a thing as food. Exactly. That's the point. It here. doesn't have to necessarily be filled for everybody always. But the kind of thing must exist for the desire to make sense. Exactly. And I think it also helps to go to the transcendentals, to look at truth, goodness, and beauty. These are things that we want without limit. Mm -hmm. You know, we're never satisfied with just one new fact. We want another. We're not just satisfied with a little bit of beauty. We want more beauty. And even the most beautiful things, there still comes a point when you read Shakespeare and you say, well, is that it? I want more. Right. More, more. <laughs> Every toddler does a little sign language. More, more. I thought you would go with Oliver. Please, sir. Please, sir. Can I have some more? You want more? <laughs>
And then there's that family guy where Stewie's there, and he pulls out a gun and says, all right, drop the gruel. Put it in the bag, please. <laughs> uh, let's move on to another typical Louisian uh, trade. That's as well as appearing on the Council of Trent, I was also interviewed by John DeRosa from the Classical Theism podcast. Although this was actually recorded quite some time ago, it was released, I think, about a week ago. Now, in this interview, once again, I provided the listeners with a little bit of background about who Lewis was and his life. But with John, we spoke more about Lewis's influences, as well as his apologetics and his relationship to classical theism. Here's a clip. So the last one I wanted to uh, mention is the argument for morality. And you're going to encounter this if you crack open mere Christianity. The book itself is divided into four books, and really the entire first book is devoted to this argument for morality. Because one of the things that's really great about Lewis is he doesn't just jump into the Bible said it, therefore you should. He starts on the basis of things that we can agree with. And he actually opens the book by saying, everyone has heard people quarreling. And he says that they say things like, uh, how would you like it if someone did the same to you? Or that was, that's my seat, I got there first. Or um, give me a bit of your orange because I gave you a bit of mine. Or come on, you promised. And he points out that what's really interesting about this is that the person saying it isn't simply saying that what the other person did doesn't happen to please him. He's appealing to some kind of standard of behavior that he expects the other man to know about. And over the course of book one of Mere Christianity, Lewis examines what's happening here and that it's pointing to a real right and wrong and a moral law. And he says that some people might try and deny this. And he says that as soon as they try and do this, um, they might say that right and wrong don't exist in their actions, but they don't say that in their reactions. Basically, as soon as they are wronged, they will be appealing to this moral law. But he then goes on and looks at the possible sources of this moral law. Is it simply personal taste, culture, whatever's convenient to me? Uh, is it just instinct? Is it education? And he shows why each of these is an insufficient explanation for this moral law. And so he draws that book to a conclusion with, well, if there's this moral law and if we break it regularly, it, uh, it also implies that there's a moral law giver. And as with most things in classical theism and, and apologetics in general, you don't have all of the attributes of God, but Lewis uses this as his starting point to build a cumulative case for God and then specifically the Christian God. And the advantage of this argument, the argument for morality, uh, by arguing that there is a moral law and one that we break, it points us into something into something else. It points our need for a savior and therefore the gospel. That's beautiful. Those are three arguments from C.S. Lewis. He he wrote a lot on them. And I, I at towards the end, I'm gonna ask you for recommendations, David, for you know, what if people have never read Lewis, what you're gonna recommend? But those are great for talking about the existence of God. But I want to move on to our second pillar then. So you and I love how you just said this kind of points to our need for a savior because our second pillar at the Classical Theism podcast is that Jesus is our Lord and Messiah, or you could say Jesus is our Savior. And I know Lewis had a lot to say about this, so what did he do to defend Jesus? And take us into some of those details. Well, returning to mere Christianity again, at the end of book one, he's concluded that there is this moral law and there's this power behind the moral law. And then as he goes through book two, he looks at what this could be, and he looks at the rival conceptions of God. So he first of all looks at pantheism and looks at why that's incoherent. Uh, he looks at dualism, sort of something closer to Zoroastrianism, the idea that there are these two equal and opposite powers in this perpetual battle. One is good and one is evil. And again, he shows why that's an incoherent worldview. And then he eventually brings it all of the way to Jude Jewish, Jewish monotheism and ultimately Christianity and about how the God of the Bible has reached out to us, firstly through uh, the our sense of conscience, the, the moral law that we've already talked about, um, as well as sending the prophets and the good dreams. That, that's what he calls what he sent to the pagans, the idea of the, 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 the both the Greek mythology and um, and also later the, the philosophy, that it was, it was a preparatory, preparing them for the gospel and then ultimately the coming of Jesus. And in apologetics, you've got to go to the person of Jesus because that helps you sort out truth very quickly because almost every religion has a statement about who Jesus is. And this is probably the greatest thing that Lewis brought to the conversation is his trilemma. 
again, he didn't, this didn't come just from him. He was drawing on earlier authors, but again, he popularized it and communicated it in a very pithy way. He says that you, you really can't say that Jesus is just a good moral teacher uh, and deny his claims to be God. He says that doesn't work. He's either got to be liar, lunatic, or Lord. Either he's lying when he's, when he's saying these things, and that doesn't that is not the impression that you get from the Gospels. You, everybody always says he's a very good man, uh, a lunatic, the same thing there. People don't say that this is clearly a madman because of the beautiful wisdom that he has. And so he says that really leaves you with the final option, that he is Lord. But the, the, the key point to this argument actually isn't even just to say that Jesus is Lord. It's just saying you cannot say that he's just a great moral teacher and then ignore his claims to divinity. He says, don't let us come with any of that patronizing nonsense. And what's interesting is Lewis actually presents a very similar argument to this in the Chronicles of Narnia. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the youngest child, Lucy, she comes back and she says that she's been to this magical land in the wardrobe. And the, her older siblings go to the professor of the house, and they're stunned that he actually believes Lucy. And he basically presents the trilemma. He says, well, she clearly isn't mad. You've told me that she is a very truthful child. So until we hear otherwise, let's just assume that she is telling the truth. That's fantastic. I, I, I didn't know that he used that trilemma in Narnia. I, I got to pick up that series and give it a try. I just have never been a huge fiction reader myself, but it sounds like it would be a lot of fun. And to think that it even has that correspondence to Jesus. I, I was exposed to the trilemma as well through Dr. Peter Kreeft, and he expands it to the idea of like a quadrilemma, like adding myth mm -hmm. to it, like that Jesus was a myth. Does Lewis have anything to say against that? Or the idea that Jesus was really more, that the myths developed around him, that it wasn't actually the genuine historical Jesus that's recorded in the New Testament, that might have not been as big of a wave until after Lewis had passed away. Or did he have? Did he respond to that as you know of? Yes, as, as you say, that was, that was more of a response of later writers. Uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to attack the trilemma by saying, oh, no, there's this fourth option. Um, Lewis didn't address it directly, but it it really, how you would answer that today is you would point to textual criticism. Uh, and that was actually something that had shocked Lewis while he was still an atheist, when he was having tea with a fellow atheist, who, who commented how good the authenticity and the historical veracity of the Gospels were, he, he actually commented, it's almost like they really happened. Um, and I think also Lewis's, Lewis's understanding of textual criticism and his, him being steeped in myth, he says in a couple of, couple of places, they, these don't read like myths. We know what myths sound like and the structure they have, and this isn't it. And today we would say, well, that's because they're Greco-Roman biography, not myth. And probably something else that's worth saying is Lewis is responding to people who say, that they believe that Jesus existed. They believe he was a good moral teacher, but deny his divinity. That's the primary force of this argument to say, no, that's not an option for you. And we could go on to say that myths don't develop within decades. Uh, and there's, there's been a lot of research for this. Dr. William Lane Craig, he's, he's done a bunch of stuff on this. And also just other things like the gospels contain embarrassing details, like uh, the, the apostles uh, being very bad apostles. <laughs> and... Uh, the first witnesses to the resurrection being women. These are not things that you put into a myth. This sounds much more like reported historical fact. Well, I'll tell you what, C.S. Lewis, he really got the ball rolling with some high-level stuff, defending the existence of God, talking about Jesus, popularizing this trilemma. But I, I, I will say it's still... To this day, people want to try to take the position that he rules out. They just want to say Jesus was a good moral teacher... But you know, he, not that he was God, not that Christianity was true. He didn't rise from the dead, and they don't want to. They don't want to take the next step. And I think Lewis points out that well, if if you exclude that myth category, if these are reliable accounts of Jesus, you have to take him more seriously than just saying he's a good moral teacher. David, it's great stuff on God and Jesus, but classical theism. I got just a couple more questions for you. So we want to get to classical theism. So hopefully those clips will motivate you to go and listen to the full episodes on the respective podcasts. Just simply search for Council of Trent, S-E-L, and classical theism. I've listened to both podcasts for quite some time. They're both fantastic, and it'd be worth your while subscribing to both. 
I'll make sure I put links in the show notes to the individual episodes. As always, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pints with Jack. Oh, and Matt and I are going to be having a mailbag episode at the end of this season. So if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us on social media or through our website at pintswithjack.com. Next week, I'll be posting my interview with Dr. David Clark, where we discuss his companion book to The Great Divorce, which is called C.S. Lewis Goes to Heaven. Matt and I only discovered this book towards the end of our study of The Great Divorce, but if you're a fan of The Great Divorce or you're going to be studying it in a small group, it's well worth your time. And so next week, I'll be interviewing Dr. Clark, and I'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.